Okay, I was a bit scared when I uh, got that uh, I mean, we will be here in the great room, but it looks like more the people are more suited for a smaller room, so it's fine. So, we are talking about uh, RPM and the changes of the uh, last couple of, of years. Um, is anyone still packaging packages from 1999? Okay. Let's be real, it's a catchy title, but we are not really going back there. But for those who, who, who still remember 1999, RPM was still uh, version three. It was still named Red Hat Package Manager. It got renamed basically a year after. Um, and the hot new distribution was Red Hat Linux 6, and I was learning my first lines of Python by debugging Anaconda and trying to make uh, kickstart work on pre-existing uh, partitions. So it's been a while. And um, it even predates RHEL, which comes later. You can only get enterprise support for Red Hat Linux at this point. Anyone packaging back then yet? Already? One, two, yeah, a few. So, 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 to be honest, I only got into RPM development like a decade later, so I'm... But we did package back then. So, the reason I'm doing this talk is it's very difficult to actually get a grip on how things change in RPM. Um, and the reason is there are different kind of, of uh, changes that happen, and many of them happen over a relatively long time. Yes, from time to time, there's this new shiny feature that pops up and is done in a, within a few weeks or, or, or months and then released, but often there are huge long arcs of development where things come together piece by piece by piece. And so even if you read the release notes, it's hard to get the full story of what's really happening. So I've been going through all those release notes, which is pretty long. Who's reading those? <laughs> hey, there, there are people that actually read them. So how do this feel? Is this entertaining? <laughs> so there, 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 are, there are different opinions on this. But they're pretty long, actually. But even reading the, the last release notes often doesn't give the full picture of, of what's happening. Um, and one of the reasons is many features can only be done step by step by step, so you need something changed here, then something changed here, and so it's, the change propagates through the code. And there are other things that are more themes, like, like where you fix something and you need to fix it everywhere. We'll come to those. And another reason why many things take a long time is because we don't want to break anything, especially not all those spec files that are out there, which are a few. And so often a feature gets introduced, then it gets turned into a warning, then it's letting it sit there a while, and at some point later it's turned into an error or into a more a stern warning first. So many things, even if they're easy to implement, they have a long life cycle to actually be implemented. And even if they're um, enabled, it often takes a long time for packages to pick it, picking them up. So implementing a new shiny feature is not worth anything unless it actually makes its way out into distributions and being used. There are a couple of examples I will just not talk about today. <coughs> um, that takes years to, to get anywhere. Even if it's a small feature, it's only like a handful of lines of code. Um, one of these things that have uh, been going on through all the last year is tidying the screws. So there are a lot of things in RPM which were not checked that well. So people could do something in their spec files that they really shouldn't, like using weird, uh, weird non-printable characters in provide names, like uh, having syntax errors in macros and stuff like this. And, RPM was really not that great in checking those. And so there's a continuous stream of little fixes that uh, tightens this down and makes things into a warning and, or tells them into an error. 
that uh, there's like half a dozen macros now that, is a, that allows people to basically go back to the old world for some things, uh, like checking for empty file lists and stuff like this. But a lot of things we have done mostly unnoticed, where we just said, well, that's an error now. So um, it's worth to ha take a look into your build logs from time to time to see what actually has been switched on uh, over the years. One of the bigger things with this was uh, probably enc uh, the encoding uh, change. So traditionally, RPM uh, allows basically random bytes for many things, like names and, and, and whatever. And this has always been a, an issue, especially with YAM, which tries to show this in, within Python and ter to turn that into a Unicode string. And <clears throat> Um, so there have been multiple s steps to actually tie, uh, to force people to use um, uh, UTF-8 only. And a couple of years ago, we just uh, made that into a warning. Whenever you had some data uh, within the header, which means any, any string data in RPM, basically. Um, <clears throat> and there's also a macro that, um, that we added uh, back then, and that just got switched to one, I think. So it's the default now. Panu probably knows more precisely uh, in, in Fedora. So it's default now. So if whenever you put something in, in there that's not UTF-8, you actually get an error. Um, one thing why this took so long is what to do actually when you can do that. Of course, you don't want to break packages that are already built, do, that do already have non-UTF-8 uh, stuff in them, and it was an issue. Just recently, um, there's now a uh, Unicode uh, decoding where you can, encoding, decoding, decoding actually, where you can have arbitrary data that's decoded into Unicode, and so you basically have bytes in Unicode now, so if, if something is messed up, it tr gets translated in these uh, uh, bytes, uh, character range, and you can encode it back to UTF-8, UTF-8, uh, so it's byte, the same bytes again, so that's, uh, but it's just got recently added into uh, Python 3, and so that's what we are doing now, and would have been help, helpful much earlier, but often you are bound with, with the environment and you can't just do it. Um, another large story that I will go only briefly is a large file support. It's probably not that interesting for most of I hope for most of the packagers, unless you're going to package, anyone packaging files more than four gigabyte? Uh, okay. Hi, hi, Facebook crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also something that took like, I think, three or four releases to actually get that, because you, you, you first you realize, well, all those integers should actually be unsigned. And then you realize, yeah, but there are not, so you go through all the code, and change all the types, then you say, well, and there should actually not be 32-bit, there should be 34-bit, and then you change the codes, the, the types again, then you add the API to actually uh, hand that around, then you add new text to actually be able to, to show this to a user. Um, to take a long short, uh, story short, so if you're doing, so you can just package large files now. For, as, a, as a package, you basically have, have not to do nothing. But you have to do something if you're using uh, RPM or DNF or YAM as a tool. Um, these are the new tags. They are automatically generated even for files that don't have large files, so please use those. Um, otherwise, you will run into problems as soon as you um, encounter packages with large files, and there are people who actually create them for some reason. Um, one, another thing that was necessary was creating new payload format for that, so RPM uses uh, CPIO. So I was talking to CPIO upstream and said, you know, it's current year, it would be really cool if CPIO would uh, support large files. What about like extending the, the, the size field, have a new format, there are multiple formats in CPIO already, so it's not a big deal. And he said, who are you? Aren't you one of those RPM guys? Aren't you the only one who's still using CPIO? Go away! <laughs> we said, okay, okay, okay. We will just throw all the sizes out of the format and use the metadata we have in the header anyway. So, uh, but as a result, 
uh, CP RPM to CPO no longer works for large files because there's no CPIO format that actually can have large files. So there's a new tool that creates tarballs, um, but if, if you run into the problems, that's the reason why. Um, <clears throat> now we come to things that actually affect the, the spec files uh, in a meaningful way. So in 4.11, we added auto setup and auto patch which basically removes the need to have another line for applying the patches. That's basically based on putting, making the sources and the patches available in Lua, and then you have some macros that use that to actually uh, apply the patches. Anyone not using this right now? Who has still like patch lines with numbers in your spec files? Look into this. <laughs> um, we did it so that's in, in 4.11, so it's quite a while ago, so you people have no excuses. Uh, but uh, a few months ago, we were looking at this again and thought, well, those, those actually patches that we add in the spec file still are pretty annoying. They create all those uh, merge conflicts whenever you try to use this git. It would be much easier if, they, if, they, if, you, don't, if you wouldn't need to change the numbers all the time. And then someone dawned us that we are actually using computers. Computers can count up. So if you have a number and then add one, you get another number that's one bigger. And so um, it took us like, you know, 20 years to figure that out. <laughs> and so in the um, last release, you can just use patch without a number and RPM is counting up. Um, and after we finished that, we thought, yeah, that's pretty nice and pretty neat, and you don't need a number, but what is this patch string doing in front? Um, why do we need that? And I realized, yeah, we don't need it. You can just have a section where you just put the, put the spec files in. So it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to come up with the easy solutions. I don't know. It's, if, if anyone has, has an idea how to be better with this, I have no clue but it's in the current release, so you can actually use it and just put them directly in, and we hope that will simplify um, working with this Git a lot. Um, then another huge arc are scriptlets. Um, when I started with RPM, I was uh, doing a lot of work on performance tuning, and there were a lot of bottlenecks in in, in RPM that, that weren't working that great is, I won't go into the gory details, but, that, but after we've done quite some work, we were doing benchmark and it turns out, yeah, RPM is not that slow now, but all those scriptlets take forever. I mean, if every, back then, basically every package spawned at least one scriptlet, and so if you have an update with a couple of hundred uh, packages, and many of them are small, so spawning a new shell, doing some weird stuff, updating things uh, was a problem, so there's a huge effort getting rid of scriptlets. Uh, who has still scriptlets in their packages? Yeah. You, you, it's hard to get rid of them, but we got rid of a lot of them. Um, so please, if you can, avoid them. Try to do things at build time. Try to do it in startup scripts so you at least don't slow down the updates. Um, and for actually cleaning most of the complicated stuff off, we introduced file triggers. Um, I don't even, I think it was done in, in 413-ish. Um, <clears throat> which is also something that took quite a while to get together right. So that's at least the second attempt to get this done. Um, and it's what basically, it's pretty simple. You basically specify a pattern of files and say, well, run, this, run a script with those files. Those files get passed in by standard in, and so you can do stuff like updating all your caches, all your um, uh, catalogs, whatever. Um, this has the huge benefit that scripts are no longer copied over in all, of, uh, all, all packages, basically. We had uh, uh, LD cache. Uh, in all, basically all packages and stuff like this, and they are mostly gone in, in Fedora, as far as I know, unless someone 
tells me I'm wrong. Uh, so if you have use cases where you have a lot of package, a lot of files that need treatment, uh, but they're dispersed over a, a large number of packages, you can use this to actually centralize this code so you only have one script and don't have to copy that all over. Also, you, you can run it uh, post-transcription, a uh, post-transaction, which we also have with a regular script let now, so you can run the script once after you did the installation and not after every package, and it helps a lot. Anyone questions to this? Because that's, that's kind of important. <laughs> so if you have tr scripts, try to get rid of them. It helps a lot. And makes the packages a lot easier. <clears throat> so another feature we, we added was weak dependencies, which is kind of stands out a lot, but I think is actually not as useful as it looks at the first, uh, first glance. There are like four of them. They, are, they come in two varieties. There are the strong ones, which are basically used like, require, like it requires that may break. And there are weak ones, which are basically left, which are currently ignored by our tooling. The original idea when they were introduced was to have like UIs that would say, well, those other packages look interesting too. Maybe you want to install them. But it's, I've not yet seen someone actually making use of that. But they are currently used for um, choosing the right packages if there are alternatives. So it might say make sense to use the weak ones if you have multiple alternatives and your package has an opinion on which it likes most. Um, one thing where they are useful is there are also there's reverse variants, so you can attach your package to another package. That's not that interesting for distribution level because in, within the distribution, I mean, we are all friends, we are all getting along, so it's easier to just do it the, the other way around. You go to the main package as well, you need to, you need to require my package. But if you're a third party, uh, uh, distribu uh, third party repository or if you build your own uh, packages, that's interesting, so you can have like its extension things or plugins that you want to attach to a, a package of the main distribution later on. And so they're pretty useful for this. Um, where it gets um, more interesting is uh, Boolean dependencies. Who has actually used those in one of its package? There are a few, but not that many. Um, uh, it, it looks a bit complicated, but it basically says it works like the normal uh, 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 requires and provides. Um, and you basically can have a Boolean expression which follows the normal rules. If you want to have both packages required, you just make an end, or you can do an or. You can, you in theory, can have as complicated compre uh, expressions as you want. In practice, most cases will not involve more than like three packages and or four, and one of the packages is the one where the expression is actually in, so most of them are just, just uh, two argument expressions. Um, where they're interesting is, is whenever you have a package you want to put in between two packages. So imagine you have like uh, multiple backends, like for a database, but you don't want to ship those, but you only want to have those uh, backend packages installed if the database is actually there. And you, of course, don't want to require all the databases that, are, that, that you may want, but you want, whenever a database is installed, you want those backend packages. It's also used for fonts and for language packages. So you can have a package that represents support for a given language. Then you have maybe a, 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 some application with split out packages for different languages. And then with the Boolean dependence, you can basically specify if the application is there and if the language is, is in, this language support is installed, then also install the language pack. So there's uh, a lot of more automatic stuff in, language, in package selection that can be done with that, that cannot be done with, with normal provides and requires uh, alone. Many of this stuff is actually done automatically, so people don't even need to do it by hand, so it's basically made of, of, of scripts to put those in. Um, when we uh, had this finished, um, 
we were very proud, and, um, but Michael Schroeder said, well, you know, there's, there's this one case where you have like a, like a range and you want to make sure that the package that matches both things is actually the same package and not, so if you say you need to be bigger than one and smaller than three, so you don't want 0 0.1 and 5.8 uh, at the same time. Um, and so after a while, and people were complaining that stuff like this kept happening, we added another operator, which is with and without, which basically requires both uh, packages that, that, that all packages that, uh, um, that match those subterms to be the same package, which is still not 100% correct, but it's good enough, unless you have all kind of weird uh, provides within this one package. But most cases uh, work just fine. So if you have uh, uh, dependencies on, on version ranges, the with operator is, is the go-to thing. And it's actually currently used in, I think, the Rust uh, uh, packaging tooling, which are automatically creating those from the, uh, from the Rust dependencies, which do have those uh, uh, ranged uh, requirements. And RPM could not do that previously. Anyone run into something like this? Or is this pretty fringe? Except you're a Rust developer? Okay. In Ruby also? Yeah, all those modern languages have weird stuff and so they need that. It's fine, it's fine. We get it. It's important. We're happy to help. Um, there's another thing that's probably hidden from most, from most uh, packagers, and that's uh, the changes that have been done to dependency generators. So there's a new interface since 4.11, uh, where you can basically have a small file that de declares what files you're actually interested in. RPM runs uh, libmagic, so basically file, on all files that are shipped with the packages, so we do know they are type, and you can basically match on those types, or on the location, or on the file attributes to select the files you're interested in for the, your dependency generator. And you basically get a script that just gets handed uh, the file names, and you can uh, write out whatever dependencies you want uh, by standard out. So it's pretty easy to do. There have been some work. So there's a new Python dependency generator, which used to in the past only said, well, it's a Python script, we need Python, and now it's actually go through and, and figures out what modules you need and stuff like this. Uh, the Rust people have done quite some work. There are a couple more, actually. So um, I encourage everyone to, who does a lot of packages in a specific domain to think about this and to come, um, and if you need help, talk to us. If you can't, simplify your packaging a lot by adding one of those uh, dependency generators. For now, this cannot be done within the package, but has to basically ship uh, with RPM build or in a separate package that you uh, build require. Um, but it's actually not that complicated to do. You can be, it's just an executable. You can use your own language you're working in. So I encourage everyone to, to look into this. And because the thing is, we do RPM and Maybe we do RPM well, but we have actually no clue about all those languages that are out there. And we can't, and we won't, and even if we could, we wouldn't. So um, it, people need to step up and say, well, this is what we need, and we are happy to help. It's actually not that complicated. It's a small text file. It's an executable that whatever, does whatever you want or need. And you basically just need to write them out. You can also. Uh, have uh, dependency generators for the weak dependencies now. So if you need those, that's also working, I hope. Any questions to this? Yes? Are you in any discussions with Golang packages for using this for Go rendering? Mm. Yeah, the question was if we are in discussion with the Go uh, package. Uh, Go sick for uh, Go packaging. We are not really currently, but please, please talk to us. 
as I said, it, it's not complicated, but we are happy to help. I know that the, the Rust people have done something. There's probably something brewing in the background, but the thing is, as it's not that complicated, people don't even have to ask us. It's basically just one executable that you put somewhere. But if there are questions and people need help, please, please talk to us. Another uh, bigger thing that we added, uh, especially for those uh, new languages like Rust and Go, is uh, dynamic build dependencies that will get just added with uh, 4.15, like this summer. Um, and the issue here is those languages come basically prepackaged. So they already know what build requirements they have and what requirements they have and everything else. And um, the issue here is, of course, you can convert such a package description into a spec file, but then what? Do you want, if, if you do that all the time, you can't really uh, add patches or you have to patch in the patches to the spec file you just created or stuff like this. It gets ugly pretty quick. And so they wanted to have, be able to basically extract those build requirements during build. And that's what we uh, uh, implemented. My gut feeling is this is something we will, if it takes off, will probably improve even to one or two more steps. This is basically a first iteration. You get an, another section in the spec file, which is a script, where you can do stuff and print out the uh, build requires to standard out. So it's very similar to the normal uh, build, uh, to the normal uh, required gen uh, dependency generators, but it's within the spec file. And the reason for this is currently that um, this changes a lot how packages are built. So for now, it, the assumption was, if you have a package, you build it, and it to, if the package is not broken, the build will succeed. And this basically means we are executing all those scripts, and then we decide what we actually need to build a package so that the build basically ends, gives a return, it builds a, 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 a basically a source package that has the build dependencies into it, so you can install those. Um, and um, so it's a bit complicated to get it into the uh, build system, but we've patched mock and it works now, I hope. Um, but the mock maintainer is, is, is agreeing. <laughs> um, what you still need in the spec file, that's something to, to uh, note, is you still need to have the tools, you need to get the build requires. You still need to have put them in by hand, because otherwise uh, your interpreter won't be there <laughs> that you want to execute to, to do the calculation. Um, I think right now it only does one, one step, but I asked, there are already packages, uh, it's fixed already. So I, I repeat for those who couldn't understand. So uh, we actually fixed mock, so, so it now does multiple passes as long as there are new dependencies that come, that are added. So you actually can just uh, print the, your interpreter as the first line and then end the, the script if it's not there. And then it basically pulls itself out of the swamp by its own hair and uh, collects more and more tools and, and dependencies. So that's, that's something you can do now. And so far it has not yet broken the build system for some reason. I guess in the long run we might even do something like this fully automatically so you don't even need to do that in the, uh, in the spec file itself. In theory you could like look at the build and so what it does actually, it, it uh, executes prep first. So you have actually already the expanded uh, source code. And in theory, you could run scripts that detect stuff automatically in the background. So you don't even have to put in something in the spec file. But 
people are kind of nervous with this kind of stuff because if things go wrong, build systems um, break, or if the build takes too long. So, so that's something we've not yet planned, but that's like the long-term perspective. I mean, this is one of the features that only came into being like last year, so it's still very early for those five-year development arcs we have in RPM for many things. So that's where I stand with that right now. Um, yes. So there, there are a couple of more changes I would only want to mention briefly. So there was a rewrite of the debug uh, info that was done by Mark Wheelard mainly. So it's something the US packager don't really have to care, but it's interesting. So, but now we have split up debug info packages. So if you do debugging, you might run into, into this. So, so the layout has been changed. There have been some new links and, and things moved around. We have now support for reproducible builds, which are, I mean, reproducible builds is a moving target for many packages. But there's now uh, features in RPM, so you can actually set like build time and, and, and stuff like this. So at least the ba most basic elements of the package don't change from build to build. We switch to GPT-2. Um, there's a huge feature that I think was headed in from IBM, if I know correctly, which I don't know if anyone uses this. Uh, this is basically a feature where you put signatures for all the files on the disk uh, so you can verify that the files you're executing are actually unchanged. So it's one of those NSA things. Um, uh, a feature which is kind of there but not yet really enabled properly and we are still makes us kind of nervous is uh, uh, the features uh, minimize writes, which basically tries to not write files to disk if they are unchanged, which is uh, f uh, something that's interesting for SSDs, which wear, and so you don't want to wear them more than you actually need. It's currently not, not as much of a speed gate as you still need to unpack the, uh, the uh, package payload because it's one compressed stream of data, so you still need to seek, seek through this. Um, but at least you uh, make your SSD write longer. We are currently working on making this automatic, so actually RPM is smart enough to detect the uh, uh, SSDs. Um, we are not like quite, quite confident to switch this on for, um, um, for normal disks right now. Uh, another small feature that, that you might have not have heard about is, uh, is this uh, remove path postfixes macro, which we add, I added in between sometimes, it's just like a few, few lines patch. But what it allows is, right now you cannot have conflicting files within a build. So if you have like, if you want to have two sub packages with different config files, you can't have them the same name because you only have one tree and you have to basically pick and choose the files from those trees, um, which is kind of annoying. And with that, you can basically say, well, we can have this, this post fix and just cut it off when you package the file. Um, so that might be handy, not that you should do such thing on a regular basis, but I know people who might need it. Um, so what's next? So we will continue with a lot of small improvements. Many of those development arcs will continue into the future. Um, when it comes to bigger things, I mean, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been standing here for a while promising new databases, but really this year I promise things will happen. So there are two candidates right now. There's the NDB, which is uh, implemented by Michael Schroeder, um, which is basically similar to the solve file that uh, libsolve uses. It's very... Um, um, refined C code, um, and, but there are people who have tested it a lot um, and are very happy with it. So it looks like it's actually working. It's much more stable than, than Berkeley DB, which has a lot of issues. Um, and it was just declared stable, whatever that means. Um, so it will, it's in, in the uh, upstream repository already and it was already 
in the previous release as like a experimental uh, database backend. Pano is currently working on a backend based on SQLite. Some people that already used RPM back in 1999 might remember that such thing had ex has already existed a couple of years ago. The problem with that was it basically mirrored the Berkeley DB structure very, very closely. So there were multiple SQLite databases that we are doing lookups, and so the problem with databases is writing data or reading data is cheap, syncing them to disk is fucking expensive. And so uh, if you have multiple databases, you're waiting on each of them uh, separately, and so things uh, take a while. And so it got ripped out of the code base, uh, I don't even remember, five-ish, seven-ish years ago. Um, and, but it turns out if you're using SQLite properly, and, and uh, it actually is performance-wise very similar to, to Berkeley DB, so it's good enough for us. And um, using a, pro a, a database that has actually tools with them, so you can may be able to recover if something goes wrong is, is uh, something that's, that makes it worth still pursuing this, even if we have another option. Um, we will see how this ends up in the end, performance-wise and otherwise, but we'll probably have both backends available. There also is an, uh, uh, an LMDB backend for a while, but the problem is um, there are the LMDB has some limitations that we really don't like, and upstream first promised that they would go away, and then they changed their mind, and so it sits there, and um, also uh, I hear it's not as good when it comes to reliability as other options, so that's probably going to go away at some point. Um, another thing that already started with the last um, um, release is, uh, Multi-threaded building, our kernel people are very, very unhappy with the way RPM behaves. They have all those nice PowerPC machines with a lot of uh, processors, but uh, single processors are not that fast, and then they execute make for the kernel, and it, tr it all goes on those uh, processors, and after the build is done, RPM starts to build a package and compresses the data in one single core, and um, um, back. Um, uh, and so it takes a lot a long time. And there are a couple of uh, scripts uh, um, within the build that does process files and stuff like that. They were all single threaded. So we are starting now making them either using uh, parallelism by, by actually um, spawning multiple processes or using uh, threading within the RPM binary. And that's going to continue. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's its own kind of wor can of worms with all kind of things that can go wrong and did go wrong. Turns out that it doesn't help if you have a lot of processors, if you uh, only have a 32-bit namespace and cannot use all the memory you have in your box and, and stuff like this. Um, so another thing I've think we will push forward is actually making more parts of the build process automated and put more information centralized. This is something that's going on that's in large part not going on in RPM upstream, but a lot in the, in the distribution. So there are a lot of people have been very, very busy writing macros and scripts and whatever for their domain. And I think that's in large part the future for, for RPM packaging. So um, to have like an intermediate kind of layer that t keeps ta uh, that uh, takes care of the special needs of all those uh, subdomains, like different languages or, or uh, different kind of, of packages. And so the call to everyone is to actually think about what needs to be better there and, 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 and how, how to gather to, to step out of the role of being a single packager that looks at a single package, but to look at the larger picture of what can be done there, and if you really need to do like copy and paste lines of spec file around all the time. This is something we already made a lot of progress over the last couple of years, but it's ongoing, and um, 
that's what I have. Questions? Yes. Not really. Um, the question was if, if uh, DNF build dep uh, will still work uh, with uh, this. And I guess not. It will only work for the static static ones. The, the thing is, it's, it's a more complicated question. So you, you are able to build uh, source uh, packages which include those generated build dependencies. And if you have one of those, you will get them. But if you are just looking at a spec file without building it, you won't. So it's, uh, yeah, but that, that's in the nature of it being dynamic. So you actually have to execute the, the script at some point to, to get the dependencies. Yeah, it breaks a lot of assumptions, I, I know. But it, I actually didn't want to do it at first. I said, yeah, that, that, but there are people that are persistent. And it's kind of annoying to, to do work like this manually if, if we don't have to. And I think that's, that's the future, to, to do less stuff with an editor. So yes, so what, what happens is the following. If you have just a spec file, and if, so there are multiple commands now where you can use to either build a source, R, source package that's just being packaged. That means you're not uh, extracting the sources and, and then this, uh, the file will, uh, so it will uh, put a uh, provide in the, in the source package that it has dynamic build dependencies but it doesn't have them in them yet. But you can also build them, build a source package that actually does uh, the calculation. But then it's basically you have to have the build requires installed so you can impact, so you can unpack the the sources and then run the script inside. And then you get a source package that actually has the build requires in them. If you actually just build the package and the build requires are not there, the build will terminate and you will create a source package with the build requires that are needed, so you can use that with, uh, with DNF to, to install them. Or you use mock, which does that automatically for you. It's a bit of a comp complicated process, but they're just, I would have loved it to be a simpler process, but you just can't. How does that combine with reproducible builds? Actually, I think it's not that bad with reproducible builds, because we already have this problem anyway. If you swap out the packages underneath, you don't get a reproducible build anyway. So to have a reproducible build, you have to have a reproducible environment anyway, and so the script should return the same results. So yes, it makes things more complicated, but it does not necessarily make it more complicated for reproducible builds because you need to nail everything down anyway. Any other questions? Yes. What about the long time of sending, um, I would not say bug, but the issue where the CTO can't override files if you install the directory and vice versa? Is there any plan to do something about it? <sighs> so the question was what about uh, replacing uh, uh, directories by, uh, by symlinks, which is a pain? And I understand it's a pain. And the, the problem why it's a pain is because it's not a problem that can be really solved. The problem with that is if you have, the thing is, Simlink can't have files in them, and directory can. So if you replace the, the directory with the Simlink, the files that are in the, pack, in the directory right now need to go somewhere. And there's all kind of issues with that. I still have the feeling there are one or two cases that might be possible to handle better, but a couple of people have already looked into that, and it's really hard. Because, uh, so right now what we do is we say to people, well, there's this script, you do that in the, as a pre-transaction script, and it moves files around, and it's your responsibility to know which file you're moving where. 
and why. And it's like a cop-out, and I'm not that proud of that, but just moving files around without knowing where they end up is, is also, oh. it's a problem basically that, that, that we inherit from the way the file system works. And I'm sorry, that's, that's the best answer I got for this. Yes? So, so I've, I've looked into the change log, and um, the thing is, it turns out the problem there is not that much RPM, but the tooling around that. So the question is, the problem is not taking the change log out. The problem is where to put it. So you need to put it somewhere else, and it's basically a build system, uh, disk, git, whatever thing. So if there's something RPM can do to make it easier, or help. We are happy to do that. The problem is, as far as I understand, there's, there's nothing that RPM can do on its own to make that happen. So there's something the distribution needs to step up and say, well, we want the change log to work this way, and if there's a way we can help to get it into the, the spec file easier than whatever other options you have, we are happy to help. So there was a comment to this. So I, I repeat the question. So the question here was, why don't we just pull the sources of the, of the software repackage directly like from GitHub or from, from a, a source code management system? And it would make a lot of problems go away because you don't have to add packet patches. Uh, you can basically just use the hash as a, as a safe uh, way to verify where the source code comes from and, and what's in there. And it also would get a change log from this. And the answer is, yes, you get some things of this, but you don't get the things why we need packaging. The thing why we need patches uh, uh, in RPM is because we want to divert from upstream. And the, most, and the, ma and the main, um, so if you're upstream and you can basically have a branch that says, well, this is Fedora 15 or this is uh, RHEL 6, um, that works. Yeah, if, if we would like clone those repositories and, and build from them, that would probably work. It might. Yeah, it's, it's, it can probably be done. Uh, but it, the thing is, RPM really doesn't care where you get your sources from. Um, <laughs> um, so. So that's basically a mainly a, that the thing is which makes this whole thing so complicated is because there are many moving parts and RPM is only like one thing, but most interesting stuff actually happens at the distribution level and the distribution have to make those decisions. And often there's very little we actually can do in, 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 kind of, in, in, in terms of features within RPM that actually makes that, that even helps there. So, but if there are, stuff we can do, we will, will happily do. Um, but the two, when you come to the change log, the change log in the packages are actually very, very different from the change log of upstream. Um, 
because we are interested in what changes did we actually do. And the change log upstream is typically much, much too big and much too fine-grained for the, for the things we want in packages. But that's like a, that's a complicated argument to be because who wants what, why, where? And, and, and RPM as a tool is kind of agnostic to, to, to this discussion. You can put whatever you want in your change log when it, as far as we are concerned. But um, um, yeah, it's a, disc it's a discussion that probably will still take a while within Fedora to actually come to a solution there. And I really hope we get there at some point because it's, mm, Um, so the question, so there was first a comment that indeed the spec file, uh, the change log needs to be something configurable so people have, different people have different um, uh, options. Then there was the question about uh, templating in the spec files um, and if there's any news. There's not really much news about it. My thinking goes now more and more to the point that we probably need to push those scripts and, and macros that we are seeing currently in things like Ruby and, 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 and Go um, further out because that, that's basically the, the gateway to get this done. And at some point, RPM can probably help with a couple of, of uh, uh, making this even easier than, than, than those uh, um, macros and, and uh, stuff we are doing right now. But in the end, I guess most of the work needs to be done in those uh, 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 scripts that concern themselves with, with those types of packages. So, so there's, there's, I'm sure RPM can, can help there, but it can't basically do it. It's something that needs to be done in those separate uh, pockets. And I guess we are getting there. So that when you look at the last year or two, there was quite some progress made, but not within RPM, but in the distribution where you have new, new dependency generators, new macros to actually uh, um, do the builds for those languages. We have the uh, dependency, uh, the build dynamic build dependencies, which do a lot of work for the packagers um, from, from the uh, Rust, I forgot what they're called. Uh, they have a name. Um, so there's progress there, but it's actually not that much feature in RPM, but it's a feature in distribution, basically. Okay. If you have any more questions, please talk to Florian outside. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>